This video is going to be two things that are basically going to be review for you from calculus. Um, the first is separable differential equations, and you've already even solved one of these, but there is something I do want to talk about with it. So when you did the M&M &M example, uh, you came up with a differential equation that basically says that the rate of change of that population was proportional, so there's K, to the population itself, and specifically for the M&M &M experiment, that proportionality constant right there was half, because the M&Ms in general decreased by half every time. All right, so if we want to solve this using separable, and we've already done this in class, uh, we divide by P to get all the P's on one side, so all of one variable on the other. K can go anywhere, but it's a little bit easier to leave it on that right-hand side. So we've all got all the P's on the other, K is a constant, and uh, the t's are on the other side. Integrate both sides. On the left hand side we get natural log of p and on the right hand side we get kt plus some constant. So kt plus some constant. So now if we want to solve for p what we would do is exponentiate both sides because e and natural log undo each other so we get p is equal to e to the kt plus c. So this, if you use exponential rules, is equal to e to the kt times e to the c. I'm going to put the e to the c out in front. And now e is a constant, it's 2.71 whatever. c is a constant, and so we can just call this a constant. I'll make it a big c if that makes you uncomfortable that it's the same. It's not quite the same, but it's just a constant that's out in front. So whenever we use this, we use this little this little exponentiation trick to specifically put a constant out in front. Um, and let me show you why. So if this was an IVP, so an initial value problem, and had some initial value, I don't know, I'm going to use 8 because that's my favorite number. Um, and if I solved for C using this initial value, so the population is 8. C e to the k t is 0. So e to the 0 is 1, and I get c equal to 8. And so this gives me that p is equal to 8 e to the k t. So there's my solution. Now, there's no reason why you couldn't have used, say, this guy as your solution. Um, but let me just show you what that would look like, just so you can see why we write it in this specific form. So the population, if I had it in that form, C would be a little bit different. Um, it would have to be the natural log of 8. Um, and so you can see that that's just not the most advantageous form, and in this other form we get more information from it. We could actually look at this solution right here and say, hey, its initial condition is 8. All right, so let me do another example here um, of, um, of a separable equation. Um, so let's, whoops, I need a pen. Let's try that. Uh, dy dt is equal to t squared minus 1 all over y squared. And um, so let's get all the y's on one side. So I'm going to multiply by y squared on both sides. I am at the same time going to multiply by dt. So I get all the y's on one side, all the t's on the other. Integrate both sides. Integral of y squared is y cubed over 3. The integral of t squared is t cubed over 3, and the integral of 1 is t and I'll add my constant. By the way, I'm only adding a constant to the right-hand side because really there is a constant on this left-hand side, like right there, and there's a constant there, but say I'm moving the one from here over here and combining them. So it's just easier to just write one constant on the right-hand side. Um, now I'm going to solve for y. So I'm going to multiply by 3. y cubed equals t cubed minus 3t plus, well, 3 times c is just another constant. I can do that. Then I can, I'm going to take the cubed root of this whole thing. As a reminder, I cannot distribute that cubed root. So that c even is underneath 
that cubed root. So there is the solution to this differential equation. It's not an IVP, so this is the general solution. Um, and it also is in an explicit, explicit, sorry, form. And basically what that means, explicit form, is that we've got a y equals specifically. Let me give you another example where we don't. Oh, let's see, where is that one? Okay, so x, y to the fourth dx plus y squared plus 2 times e to the negative 3x dy equal to 0. So this one's even in a little bit of a different form. Okay, so remember that we need to get all the x's on one side and all the y's on the other. So I am going to move this whole term, I'm going to take that whole term, move it over, make it negative, and at the same time, you know, I think I might just divide everything by y to the fourth. So that would leave me an x dx on one side, since I divided by y to the fourth, equal to a negative, because I brought that whole thing over, y squared plus 2, I'm going to divide that by y to the fourth, because I divided everything by y to the fourth, uh, e to the negative 3x dy. And now I have that e to the negative 3x on my y side, so I need to bring that over to the x side. So x e to the positive 3x, because if I multiply by e to the positive 3x on both sides, that would get rid of that negative. Negative. Okay, now I'm going to do something else right now, because I know I need to integrate this thing. And y squared plus 2 over y to the 4th, I don't know how to integrate that right now. But I know I can divide y to the 4th into y squared and into 2. So I'm going to do that. And y squared divided by y to the 4th is y to the negative 2. And 2 divided by y to the 4th is 2y to the negative 4. And I still have my dy. All of that's negative. Okay, I think I'm ready to integrate both sides. Oh, I left out my little dx. There it is. Okay, so time to integrate both sides. So the integral on the left-hand side, this would be an integration by parts. So I'm going to come over here where I have some white space. My u is going to be x. My dv would then be e to the 3x. That makes du dx. And it makes v e to the 3x divided by 3. So on the left hand side I'm going to have u times v x e to the 3x all over 3. So u times v minus the integral of v du. So minus the integral of e to the 3x over 3 dx. Let me integrate that guy. So this first term stays minus the integral of e to the 3x is e to the 3x divided by another 3, so that's 9. All right now, I definitely have a constant on this side, but I'm going to wait, put it on the other side. Okay, so the integral of this other side with the y's, everything's negative. The integral of y to the negative 2 is y to the negative 1 divided by negative 1. The integral of y to the negative 4 is y to the negative 3 divided by negative 3. And then I'm going to add my constant. And then let me just clean up this right-hand side a little bit, because I've got a bunch of negatives. So let me take those out. So how about y to the negative 1 plus 2 thirds y to the negative 3. Now, I'm going to leave this solution just like this. And this is called the implicit form, or implicit solution. And the reason for that is that we're going to leave it in this form because we can't solve for y. Totally impossible to get y all by itself without another y on the other side. So that's the implicit form of the solution. Okay, so there's some other verbiage that goes along with separable uh, differential equations. The next the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, slope fields. Slope fields. And 
I am going to introduce a couple other um, couple other definitions with this as well. So I want to go back to this guy, the population model, dp dt equals kp. And I just am going to choose a k. Well, actually, let's just use the M&M one. So let's do dp dt equals 0.5 or 1 half the population. Now, what I'm going to do is draw I'm going to draw its slope field, and essentially what a slope field is, is a bunch of little tiny mini representations of slopes. So I could pick different values of P, and for those different values of P, I can find dP dt, which is a rate of change, which is slope. So for instance, if the population is zero, well, then if I plug in zero, zero times one half, that's zero. If the population is one, then my slope is going to be one half. If the population is two, my slope is going to be uh, is going to be one. Let me put those onto a graph here. So now this is a graph. I'm going to graph population itself with respect to time. So notice that I am graphing the solution to this differential equation using just the slopes. Okay, so at zero, when p was zero, so p is on a vertical axis, when p is zero, the slope is zero. So I'm going to draw a bunch of little tiny mini slopes. These are all little tiny slopes, different values of time, but they're all zero. Then when p is one, the slope is one half. I'm just drawing a bunch of slopes at p equals one that are about one half. Then when p is 2, the slope is about 1. And this is really hard with this pen, which it doesn't draw well anyways on this pad. But hopefully you'll get the idea. And then if we keep going, if we said p was 3, well then we'd get a 3 half slope. So you can see the slope kind of keeps getting bigger as p gets bigger. And can I draw a steeper slope than what I have right there? Barely. All right. Now, negatively, on the other side of this, um, on the other side of the t-axis, you can see that the same thing would happen if we had a population of negative one. Of course, that makes no sense. But then the slope would be negative one half. So we really, on the other side of this, get a mirror image. So I'm just, I'm really just drawing the mirror image of what I have. All right, now a couple other definitions that go along with this. This guy right there, P equals zero, that is called the equilibrium solution for this specific equilibrium solution. And it's the equilibrium solution for only for this specific differential equation. So that is the value of the population in which the population isn't going to change. If we had no M&Ms, it's totally impossible for them to decrease. And so um, their rate of change is zero. So the equilibrium solution is really where, where the derivative where dp dt equals zero. Now, the other reason that we drew this, um, and really the reason that we draw slope fields, um, is so that we can get an idea of what a solution might look like to a really complicated differential equation. Um, this is kind of a dumb one to draw a slope field for because we know the solution already. We can find it, and it's really simple to find. But for differential equations that are not so simple, um, we like to um, we we like to draw the slope fields and get a solution quickly. So let me just draw an example here. If we had like p of zero is equal to, let's start at one half. So I'm saying that my initial condition, I'm starting right there. Now what I can do is kind of follow these slopes. So I follow it a little bit that way. And it looks like it rises a bit, keeps on rising. And then if I went 
backwards to it, it would go to zero. Now just notice that that green line is an exponential function. And when we just found the solution to this, it was an exponential function. So these are called solution curves. And the whole reason we want to draw slope fields is so that we can get a solution curve. We can know what a solution will look like or do as we go to infinity um, without actually having to solve the thing. All right, so here is a differential equation and its slope field, and I just googled slope field generator um, and found this mathscoop.com, which gave me this um, this slope field for that differential equation, dy dx equals 1 minus xy. Um, so again, I just want to show you what's useful. Now this differential equation, as we know it right now, is not solvable. It's not separable, and that's really the only thing that we have. We've got that, or we could just guess. Um, and so this one, we'll figure out how to solve this one in this class, but for right now, we don't know how. But what we could do is graph its solution and then get some information from that. So we could take this initial, well, it's not even initial because it's not y at zero, but we could take this condition, go to that point, so at negative one, negative one, so that's at x equals negative one, and then y equals negative one. So that's like right about in there. And then we can follow the slopes from there. So it kind of starts out flat. So I'm just generally following these lines. And then it looks like it starts to get a little bit bigger. It starts to get bigger, keeps rising, keeps rising. Oh, it gets flat again. And then it decreases. And it looks like it gets kind of flat again, decreases, and then levels off. So the thing that you can notice with this, if you follow this curve, is this leveling off. So say we wanted to know what happens as x goes to infinity. And when x goes to infinity, we can say that our solution, that y, will approach, what is that, something less than 1? I'm going to say about a third, approximately a third. Um, and so this is the type of information that we can get very quickly from a slope field. I didn't have to solve it all at all to say, you know what, really, no matter what happens here, our solution is going to go to one-third at the end.